So as part of the scan, we want to differentiate between upper cervical and lower cervical uh, dysfunction. We know if there's a gross loss of rotation that doesn't set off alarm bells because uh, for like the Canadian cer cervical spine rolls, we know the top couple joints contribute mostly to that. So we want to be efficient on how we assess OA and AA and their contributions to rotation. Knowing that the OA contributes only about five or six degrees to the rotation and half of the rotation is coming from the AA joint. So if we have a patient come in and you have them rotate to the right and that loss is greater than rotation to the left, we can do a quick biomechanical assessment to differentiate between the OA and AA. The way we do that is we can use craniovertebral flexion and extension. The, on the top of C1, where the occiput sits, those condyles are like kidney bean shape. And so when you flex, because it's a convex on a concave surface, you have this roll coming backwards. And when you extend, the roll comes forwards. So this is flexion, and that's extension. When they rotate, you, the, on that condyle, because it's kidney bean shape, part of that five degrees is a flexion to the side you're turning towards and an extension on the contralateral side. So you get this motion. So we have flexion, we have extension, and then we have rotation right, flexion on the right, extension on the left at the AO joint, and then the left would be the opposite. At the AA joint, they're convex surface on convex surface. That's where we get a lot of our rotation from. So then at the AA joint with right rotation, there's a drop on the right side of going posterior inferior, and on the contralateral side, anterior inferior. So that convex on convex causes this simultaneous inferior motion One's going anterior to the joint and one's going posterior. So if we have a restriction in right rotation, we have the options of saying the AO may be contributing somewhat to it and the AA may be contributing a certain amount to it as well. So to differentiate AO, AA, with that right rotation, what I can do is have him craniovertebrally flex. So that's flexing above C2. What that will do is that will bring the AO joint condyles back. So then we're, if we're re worrying about rotation to the right, that bilateral flexion will take that right joint, use up all of its range of motion. So then if I have him rotate to the right, I've already used up that range of motion. So if he was at 50 degrees of rotation and then that decreases to about 35 degrees compared to when he's in neutral and he goes to 50, or when I extend and he's at 50, I would know that that right joint cannot flex. So this CV flexion just takes up all that range because my options when there's a restriction in right rotation is the right OA can't flex, the left OA can't extend. So we don't know, we just know that the right side, or that it's, he's not moving to the right, it could be the right side or left side. Or at the AA joint, the left side can't go anterior inferior, the right side can't go posterior inferior. So that's that whole complex. So with this right rotation, we have a choice of four different joints that may be involved. And so using flexion and rotation and finding a greater restriction would implicate the ipsilateral side. Using extension rotation, if there was a greater restriction, would implicate the contralateral side. If there was no change with CV extension and flexion with rotation, that would implicate the AA joint. And then we would do glides to see if we could tell the difference. So that is a quick biomechanical assessment. 
the upper cervical.